So for about the next 20 minutes, I want to talk to you about two interrelated projects. The first one is Soft Talk Apple Project, in which we're doing a definitive online digital archive of Soft Talk Magazine, uh, which uh, basically captures the dawn of the microcomputer and digital age that we all live in today. That's the what of what we're doing, and the other side of the coin is factminers.org, which is the open source uh, software community that at this point is, is Tim Lin and myself uh, and some uh, interest, but we're growing into a community that will be developing a libraries, archives, and museum-based social gaming platform uh, that will be uh, uh, able to generate uh, semantically rich uh, models on uh, archives like the Soft Talk Apple project. So before I, I talk a little bit about the projects themselves, to give you a sense of, of who Timlin and I are, and Timlin, um, my hero, she's, uh, she's here, she's the, um, we're citizen scientists slash historians, it means that we're uh, but we are not museum informatics professionals. We're independent, unaffiliated, and it goes without almost without saying unfunded, um, but hopefully by this time next year that won't be the case. If, I, if you were Oprah Winfrey or Barbara Waters and asked me for three phrases uh, to describe who we are, I would say that we're passion-driven because over the last three years, both Tim and I have faced uh, stage four cancer battles and won. And when you uh, face your own mortality uh, for any period of time and struggle back, um, you realize how precious life is and uh, that you've been given a bonus round. And so we're in our bonus round and uh, we have a lived it enthusiasm for what we're doing because what we're working on is a uh, archive of the history that we lived. I was a, a, an uh, entrepreneur throughout the digital age in various capacities. And because of that, I have an unusual tech background to bring to the museum informatics community. And now a little bit about you all to get a sense of, of the history scale that we're talking about. How many of you have completed all of your degrees before you had your first personal computer? Handful of us. I, I had a, a used electric typewriter for my master's thesis and, and thought I was cruising. Um, how many of you uh, had your first personal computer in college or in high school? And how many grew up literally not knowing of a time when you didn't have personal computers? In fact, most, as, most of the folks we meet today and that visit your museums and, and libraries and all, um, literally have grown up in a world where they don't know that there was life before uh, Facebook. Oh, and by the way, that picture in the corner I said I, I have, I have a kind of Forrest Gump-like uh, life through this uh, history. I'm not rich or famous, but I've been there and done that with many folks who are. And after starting in Baltimore, I was a, a co-founder of Muse Software, one of the first microcomputer software companies. I had another company, an amazing company, lost that, and bankers kept saying, boy, if you were in California, maybe they'd understand you. So I went to Soft Talk Magazine and literally said, wouldn't it be great if we put a computer in a car and, and drove around the country writing stories and then we could end up in California? And they surprisingly said yes. So uh, that, those are some pictures, which if you go to the softtalkapple.com website, you can read about our Soft Trek adventure. Now, huh? Okay. Oh. I'm getting heckled by my wife. Um, okay. Um, it's hard to believe that, because we live in this 24-7 world where the internet, Facebook, and everything has is, is been available to us. But before that, the world functioned around print documents. And for the microcomputer industry and for the digital age that was uh, developing, that print publication was Soft Talk Magazine. It was published for four years from 1980 to 84, it consists of 48 issues. Uh, at the peak, those, those show you the number of pages. Uh, at its peak, it was 450 pages uh, long, and it was extraordinarily interesting and broad content. And at its peak, it had subscriber uh, 
a subscriber list of a quarter million people. If you bought an Apple computer, you were given a card to fill in and get a free one-year subscription to the magazine. And back then, magazines were not just written by, uh, read by one person, whole families and, and streets uh, would, magazines, in fact, we have trouble uh, finding decent copies to scan because they're so doggedly uh, uh, read and reread. So what we've got now then is a 48 month time capsule of the dawn of the microcomputer and digital revolution. And by capturing that and, and not only creating a digital archive, uh, but looking to, uh, to generate a, a machine readable, fully back cloud uh, implemented uh, semantic model of that is the goal of the project. And this is a magazine that uh, here in the, the initial issue, we have a, an interview with George Lucas about how they used Apple computers uh, and microcomputers behind the scenes to do Star Wars. But this is a magazine that also would have cover stories of simple people like chimney sweeps outside of Baltimore um, and how they used microcomputers to change their uh, family business. Uh, incredibly detailed uh, articles on microcomputers in space and in uh, the arts and in every issue, incredibly detailed profiles of the companies that made the products, that, that laid the foundation for the world we live in today. But the real meat of the content that's in there, again, there was no internet, no email, no stack overflow. Um, the real meat of these issues is in all of the front matter and back matter of the, of the magazine, all the departments, where we had things like pages of meticulously curated uh, reports of what the producers of hardware and software were doing. Back when it cost as much to buy a computer as a late model car, who you bought the computer from was as important as what brand computer you bought. So there were columns about retailers and what they were doing and how they worked. Um, a lot of review information. And again, because this, this is print before electronic, even before ele desktop publishing. So all the content here had to be meticulously gathered by phone calls and note taking. It's a, a fantastic, uh, repository of what went on during that four-year period. There, there were, uh, to, to get interactive with uh, the readership, when you have so many hundreds of thousands of people reading it each month, we had contests, and of course, contest winners. No stack overflow, no email, no nothing, so the open discussion was pages and pages each issue of people asking and answering questions among themselves. Um, announcing things that they were going to do as small businesses. Uh, we had famous people like Roger Wagner writing multi-part uh, articles. This one uh, ran for about 30 issues about machine language programming. Now you have a magazine that has articles of many pages of machine language programming in the same magazine that you saw that we had things that were of general interest. So this is a, a covers the waterfront of content. But in each and one of the, the biggest uh, treasure troves here data-wise is that each month there was a meticulously curated bestseller list of all the software that was for sale in various categories. And the publisher came out of Billboard magazine where they had done the top 30 records and all. So this was a, a well-researched uh, and curated list of what programs were popular, and, and we have a 48-month uh, time series of, of what that, uh, that data reveals. So an interesting thing that I, and this again goes back to I know, I know this is the case because I lived it, we are now in a world that is 24-7 all the time, more information than you can imagine, but you imagine a world where the internet turned on for one day a month and then went off. And, and what you did was there is a, a concept that comes out of military strategy called OODA, the OODA loop. Observe, orient, decide, and act. It is what we do in life all the time. Basically, we, we observe what's going on, we orient to a situation, we decide what to do, and then we act. 
Well, if we do that in a conflict situation like military or as the business people have adopted that into business, if we loop through that decision process faster than our competition, we gain an advantage. When soft talk was published on a monthly basis, we literally had folks around the country watch their mailbox and when the magazine came in, if it didn't come to us, folks would read us over the, the telephone what was in the magazine, what were the, 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 the positions in the bestseller list, because there was a month-long clock ticking now to decide what to do for the next three weeks. So we've got this incredible archive that, that is of an industry that bumped along on a one-month cycle, and we've got 48 uh, time slices of that of, of that movement. A, a remarkably interesting data set. So when uh, a after I circled the drain for about a year and then spent the next year uh, climbing out, there was a period where all about all I could do was find stuff and say, can we throw this away because we don't need it anymore? And I came across for these two boxes of our soft talk magazines, which I had carted around all these years because they meant so much to me. And I meant to do something with them, but I never knew what. And now we know what because uh, we have our bonus round. And so we, we decided to start the Soft Talk Apple project. As soon as word got out among the folks that are friends of vin vintage uh, microcomputer, uh, Peter Kaler got in t touch with us. He had started scanning for his own purposes. We got him the issues that he didn't have. And so now we have the found, what we call the Kaler Foundation Scan. Not all great issues. They were done hastily, but it's complete. So it lets us get started on our digital archive. So now we can start moving to OCR and crowdsource editing of our content. Down in the uh, lower left corner there, uh, what we have is our first uh, volunteer archivist. That's Chris Torrance. He's a nuclear physicist in, in uh, Colorado by day and at night he's a vintage computer enthusiast who loves assembly language programming. So he's our uh, Roger Wagner volunteer archivist who is specifically uh, curating all the corpora for uh, uh, Roger Wagner's um, contribution to the magazine. And of course what that now lets us do is start getting to uh, filling out the, the uh, softtalkapple.com website, which is the uh, the repository of initially it'll be uh, PDFs and uh, and web readable versions of the magazine. But what we're really interested in doing is this: uh, the Fact Miners project is kind of a pay it forward tribute to Soft Talk magazine because it was so instrumental to so, so many folks like myself. And so we want to create the open source platform of Fact Miners where the first of a kind fact cloud that we create will be of the Soft Talk Apple project, but then that will become a, a platform that's available for other citizen science grassroots uh, history projects that want to do things similar uh, to this. And uh, something that, again, it goes back to our, uh, our kind of bonus round and facing our own mortality, something that we're very uh, interested in, in doing on our project is intergenerational storytelling. And so uh, we want to wrap not only the content of the magazine as it existed, but add to that the memories and stories of the folks uh, that, that were either contributing to the magazine or who read, because actually what we find is more people come to us because they read the magazine and were inspired, their life was shaped by it, than folks who uh, were around and actually made the magazine. Um, so uh, Timlin chased down, uh, uh, we've already got uh, chasing down authors and, and uh, finding out what they've done since then. And at one point I had a hard, as we were working on uh, the initial site, I had a hard drive uh, die and I went to a local big box electronic store and bought a one and a half terabyte hard drive for 80 bucks. And I thought to myself, remember that car I showed you that we traveled around, uh, went from Baltimore to uh, California? Uh, I have wondered, well, what would, how many Apple floppy disks would I have to take with me on that trip to be one and a half terabytes of data? Well, it turns out that our BMW, it was a 73 BMW 2002, sweet car, um, it would have had to have a convoy of 
five and three quarters long bed tractor trailers behind us filled to the brim with floppy disk drives that would have cost us $32 million. So these are the kind of, of stories that we need uh, to share so that uh, our younger generation knows that it wasn't so long ago um, that, that everything was very different. And our goal then is for the Soft Talk Apple Project to be a honeypot for research and education. And we've already started uh, to accomplish that. Uh, in the corner here, the last couple of pictures, that's Lane Nooney. She's a postdoc at NYU. She recently got her doctorate um, documenting uh, Sierra Online. She's on our advisory board, and uh, she's working with uh, Kevin Driscoll of the Microsoft Research Social Networks Group in Boston. And we're preparing a corpora for them, which I'm not allowed to tell you any more about right now. but. But, but it will be soon, and, and it will be exciting. So, I, I'm, uh, oh my gosh, okay. So what we really want to look at a bit here is fact miners and, and how we're going to uh, approach the uh, generation of the fact cloud. So there's a few things I want to just kind of uh, rip through and uh, talk to you about in terms of how we're doing uh, fact, uh, the fact miners platform. Graph, we're using Neo4j, a graph database, and basically a graph database, if you take the simple ideas of graph theory, take the modern uh, technology, wizardry of graph uh, tech, uh, software technology, combine them, you get a graph database. Graph database is basically you don't have to have rows and columns and tables and do joins and all that stuff. You basically are free to create uh, cog, you know, uh, semantic models of, of how do you think about things and create nodes and relationships so that, for example, here's one that's a start of a simple model about uh, a bookstore. And so you have people buying books and these books, some people write books, some people uh, purchase books. So basically a graph database is a way to, uh, without the structure of uh, a traditional relational database, to be able to, to create the machine readable uh, uh, con con concept models. And so you can grab something like uh, Neo4j, uh, open source, freely available uh, graph database, and begin with simple queries to, in this case, I just recreated the model in the lower corner there just to demonstrate that uh, graph databases are not nearly as exotic as you might think. So what's a metamodel subgraph? Because this is what we're doing with fact miners. We want self-descriptive uh, fact clouds so that that, um, that, that, that when thin clients that do visualization and editing uh, uh, come and connect to a fact cloud, they, they can configure not only workflows, but um, uh, what the structural uh, information in the fact cloud is. So this one, if we look at what, what is a meta model, meta model is a model of models. So the ones that we just looked at, the one on the left, which says a graph is uh, full of nodes and relationships, and relationships connect nodes. So we can, what that model then does is tell us that the model on the right is a legal model because there's no uh, connections of, of edges to edges. So what's a subgraph? Within a graph, if there are no connections between a subset of nodes in that relation in that, in that database, then that's called a subgraph. So it's a, you could pluck it out and it, and it wouldn't affect everything else. If you intentionally make that subgraph a model of the rest of the data in the database, you get a metamodel subgraph, which is the, the uh, information that is used uh, by your visualization and uh, editing uh, clients to configure dynamically to uh, a, a, a instance of, of these uh, uh, fact clouds. So what's a metamodel subgraph good for? Well, besides the obvious things like data discovery, entry, and validation, there is uh, the opportunity to do increased computational analytics. And so for a qu really quick example, because I know I'm, I'm, I'm running short on time, but I promise I'll, I'll get through. I'll get through. I have to stay calm. Um, for a real quick example, one of my undergraduate majors was journalism, and there was a saying, uh, a dog bites a man is no big deal, but if a man bites a dog, it's news. So if I were to uh, create a metamodel subgraph, uh, that represented uh, this uh, man bites dog news agency. Um, 
we would have queries that can do things like look at the data in a database and say, well, I found uh, some news, I found some stuff that's not news, and I found some stuff that um, we need to do some further fact checking on. Um, so a meta model subgraph is an incredibly flexible way to have a semantically rich model that is extensible, yet uh, yet gives you incredible uh, uh, power over validating and ex and uh, discovering facts in in your data. Okay. That's it, what would be within what would be in the meta model subgraph. Well, there's two partitions: structure and process. The structure part has to uh, be able to wend together the complex. One of the things that's challenging about soft talk is it's a commercial magazine. Commercial magazines are among the most complex document structures that you can imagine because of the the intentional wind your way through. We want you to look at ads and get lost and, and, and whatnot. So the structure of the magazine is, is complicated. And then there's all the stuff that the magazine's about. So let's take an example. I told you there were, there were uh, bestseller lists in the magazine. And how would I model that? I've done some, uh, I did some quick screenshots. I was going to do this live, but um, I did some quick screenshots, and if anybody's interested, um, we can look at it live. But basically, this is the first query, and what it does is it lays in uh, the basic structure of the magazine. So the the central dot that that's, um, that that is um, uh, surrounded by the, the uh, parts of a page. That's a page in the magazine, and all the kinds of things that might be on that page. And the tail that's coming out of it, it shows that a page is in uh, an issue. The issue is in a volume of the magazine, and the last thing in that tail is the magazine in total itself. Um, the magazine is about stuff. So off of that that node, that that tail end node, you now see yellow dots, which are the is about uh, relationship. And what this says is the magazine is about things like people, companies, uh, places, and products. So now we've got the structure at one end, and we've got um, the what it's about at the other end. Um, that uh, bestseller list had within it a structure, which was there were line items that said, um, this month, the number one product was uh, a game called Choplifter, written by a guy named Dan Gorlin, who was the developer, and it was published by Broderbun Software. So we've we've added the structure of that uh, that one uh, uh, piece of uh, a an entry on the list, and then to find where facts live, this is w the where the queries come together. What we do now is 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 when we enter and discover the fact that says choplifter by Dan Gorlin Broderbun when when we enter that fact we make an on list uh relationship for that that structural element to the product and then we reach through the product and put uh developer and uh and uh, uh publisher links to the product uh um company that that uh, published the product and the, and the person who developed it. So this is the way that, as you can see, that what we're doing is is developing that structure. We're, do, we're saying what the magazine's about, and then what facts are, are the sightings, the instances uh, of, of, of those things uh, as, as they're uh, discovered in the magazine. So what, that's what we would be curating and, and doing our games around, the idea of, of folks finding and making these connections to build the fact cloud of what uh, soft talk uh, Apple is about the uh, I, I, I won a, a domain modeling contest with with this stuff we've just looked at and somebody tweeted oh my this looks like Psydoc CRM and up to this point we didn't even know what museum informatics was and some and so I chased down um, the CRM and it was like deja vu all over again because I said, oh, I have this unusual background um, that we bring. Well, part of that unusual background is after the microcomputer industry, Timlin and I went really deep into object technology. I was an um, a executive consultant in the object technology practice at IBM Global Services, and I led a skunk works in the mid-90s where we, did, uh, we, we made frameworks that were called executable business models in 
in distributed small talk. And so I have object objectified process as well as done traditional object-oriented design. And when I looked at the CRM, I saw this great uh, division between what they call persistent items and temporal entities. Most folks look at that and are con confused like deer in the headlights because they haven't written software that objectifies process. And so I started, I was going, oh man, this is, I've been there and I've done that. Let me look deeper at it. And as I looked at it, I, I started seeing things in the diagrams that violated some of the the graph theoretic uh, things that, that I mentioned earlier as far as how a, a graph can be uh, addressed. And I, I've started a personal learning network and communicating with folks working on the CRM. And what I'm trying, uh, working on at, the, at this point is a graph interpretation of the SIDOC CRM so that we can do computational analytics on it rather than uh, just use it as pictures to uh, inspire uh, developing software. Um, this is a picture of, uh, I, I've done a, uh, uh, an article on factminers.com where I uh, describe taking CRM properties and rather than uh, describe them as relationships on, uh, on CRM class entities, um, to, that they're just another form of CRM class and uh, that they should be objectified as, as first class objects. And then the, uh, the, the way that uh, it really uh, kind of sends home how this can, why, why the, the, the time, the, the process activity objects that are in the CRM are so interesting and important. I mentioned the, uh, the executable business model skunk works that I had. Well, this is a high level UML model of a uh, agent based uh, role actor uh, executable model. And what I've done is taken some of the high level uh, SIDOC CRM conceptual reference model of museums uh, for uh, the CRM and laid them over where they would fit onto an object oriented process uh, model for microservices. Okay. And that's a, and I'm real close to being done. And so, if I if I were to look at um, at at uh, at a chunk of our our activity as uh, as a curational activity, I drilled down here, and I'm saying we're going to lay out and segment that page. Um, that page would sh would uh, show me that our players, who are actors, are doing curational activity. The things that they're doing uh, are modifications on our digital. Uh, 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 pages and those uh, activities involve in the case of segmenting um, what's on that page measurements. So th these piece parts are in the CRM. It's just that they aren't presented uh, very well, and there's not uh, there hasn't been too much effort to look at how to write software from the activity oriented stuff that's in the model as opposed to just rely on the onto ontological structural stuff. So that's what we're interested in. That's what we're working on. Um, the uh, when when uh, when I wrap up, I can just basically say um, w w there's all kinds of things we would be willing and interesting in helping you do as far as uh, making access to our our digital archive available. Um, we're here to meet and and uh, connect and collaborate with folks who might have similar interests. So. Thank you all for uh, for sticking to the to the bloody end. Thank you. Okay, I say, Jim, you hit us with a lot of terminology for this late conference, but that's cool. Uh, well. um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about uh, kind of how you align the decision to pursue a sort of semantic model approach as opposed to a more sort of conventional. You know, knowledge model. Uh, given that, I mean, certainly in, in our field, there have been a lot of attempts at that, and very few outright success. Sure, sure. Well, um, the uh, you know the interesting thing is that um, that when uh, I, my 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 cancer battle was particularly grueling, and and I literally couldn't find the keys on the keyboard while I could think in English, but a word salad came out, and so as I started to come back together and be able to think and all again. 
I met Timlin in the doctoral program in mathematical social sciences at UC Irvine back in the late 70s, early 80s. And so I knew about graph theory and, and, and uh, social networks. And one of the first things that I read about as I started to reconnect with the world and read about technology were graph databases. And I went, oh, man, that stuff makes sense to me. And when I found the boxes of magazines and 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 my thought went back to the mid 90s when we did executable business models doing doing self descriptive object oriented frameworks, I thought graph databases, uh, self descriptive da graph databases, um, Soft Talk Magazine, we've got something to do. So it, it's almost like it sounds like you're considering the archive as, as really just one of the possible proofs of concept. Oh yeah, it's a it's it, it, at IBM it would be called a folk F O A K a first of a kind, um, and and so the Soft Talk Apple project is the sandbox for the initial uh, fact cloud and the initial development effort to create the platform. But once that uh, platform's available, we hope it will be as as interesting and, and available to it, literally any uh, museum, archive, or library that would want to do something similar. And um, I see you're familiar with the research based projects. Research? Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, man. Um, I mean, Dom, Dominic Oldman and Barry Norton uh, are two of the people on my personal learning network of CRM. And, uh, and it, it's re before, as I prepared this stuff, I, I had questions with, for them which have started the ball rolling on some really interesting stuff. So that, that's actually something that a resource that I would recommend to, to people in the room. If you're interested in seeing sort of how semantic modeling of data potentially yeah. in the museum sector, uh, the research space project which is funded by Noam and, and run by uh, Don Nicole. And, and it's... They're funded, they're, they, they were the top IT guys, uh, they still are, in... Uh, the, the British uh, Museum and Research Space is researchspace.org for the website and the uh, the uh, Twitter account is at Research Space and they're super folks. They're doing great work. Um, any questions for Jim? This might be something that warrants direct conversation rather than direct questions. Oh, oh, and there will be a director's cut. Uh, of this that we'll put up on on the website and I'll, I'll actually get through uh, so thank you all